so Mr Higgins, obviously, just taking a look at um, some of the comments you made when you first um, declared your intentions to stand for the constituency, one of the first things that you mentioned was you wanted a reset in Manx politics. What did you mean by that? What I mean by that is that I want to see a lot more openness, I want to see a lot more transparency in the way in which we operate, and also I want to see better use of government money. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of projects there that are gold-plated projects or they seem to continually run over budget, and given the circumstances that we currently face post-Covid, a lot of other issues which hopefully we'll get on to, to discuss. I really do think that it's very important that we place emphasis on those going forward. Equally, what I would say is that we need a degree of government reform. We can't just stay as we are. We've got 24 MHKs. Do we need as many as 24 MHKs? Uh, one of the things that I've also mentioned is a, is a pay rise, for, is pay free, sorry, for MHKs over the next five years. Those are the sort of things I think we've got to really start to consider. We've got to really deal with those, and we've also got to deal with the big ticket issues as well. You mentioned um, gold-plated projects um, that you believe may have gone over budget. Could you give us a couple of examples? Well, I suppose the obvious one is Douglas Promenade. That's the, that's the easy one. We don't know at the moment where that's going to end up. But, you know, I, what concerns me with the current administration is lack of scrutiny necessarily of the pink book that comes out after the budget or the light blue book, the, the government accounts. Because if you look at those sort of things... Uh, you know, if, if we look at, for example, the Liverpool landing stage, the initial cost for that was something like six and a half million, which goes to 35 million, and now potentially could go to 52 million. Where's that going to end? What, what, do we need to be spending those sort of money? Is government a soft touch that we'll just will have a budget that will continue to overspend, particularly when we've got people who are desperately in need? whether it be food banks, whether it be cataract operations, whether it be hip replacements. That's where I want to see a complete refocusing of where we're going. Uh, another example is the steam packet company. We're currently saying that uh, there's a provision for £80 million for the building of the Manxman, which is due to be, um, be here in 2023. But if you actually look carefully at the government accounts, there's a provision effectively for as much as £160 million. The public need to know what the exact position is. And that's where I'm wanting more openness and transparency across government. You're talking about these these different budgets and where you think changes could be made. You are a, you are a former Treasury member, if I'm, if I'm correct, in saying... I have, wor I have worked in Treasury, so, so, yes. So, so you have worked in Treasury. It, I suppose the obvious question there is, if you've got these views, why weren't they raised or, you know, and or addressed? If, well, if, if this is something you've been you know, privy to over time, however long that period is. No, I would make that very clear, Robert. It's not a case of I've been privy to. The information I've got here is clearly in the public domain. Um, I have been working for government. I've worked for government for 39 years. Uh, in the last 14 years, I've been involved in uh, the budget process and preparation of that work. Uh, I've been in, involved in responding to uh, political questions, drafting responses to them. But my loyalty was to my employer. I'm there working as a civil servant and it is my job when I am in that employment to serve my uh, employers. So although you've had you, you've had input, would you say that you've not been able to have enough influence over? Um, to, well, well so, as a, as a civil I, know, I, know, I know you're not in a, you're not been in a ministerial role, and that is different. But at the same time, if if you've had um, a, a knowledge behind these things, and by the sounds of it, you know it's something that you are, you know, is something that is key to to your aspirations. You know, why wasn't certain legwork done beforehand? I guess because I was a civil servant, I can't do that. I'm there to serve the people who employ me. I, I'm looking at this as an individual, and as an individual, a member of the public, Joe Public out on the street, my view may vary, and that's that, that's where I'm coming from at this moment in time. I'm no longer in the employment of Isle of Man government, but I would like to think that when I was in the employment of Isle of Man government, I was a loyal servant there. You say as well you, you've you been part of um, drafting government responses. Could you just expand on that and explain what that means? Well, that, that means when, when uh, questions come in for House of Keys and for Timwald, I'm um, 
doing what's required to draft responses for those. I don't have influence. I don't have. I never had political influence. But what I do have is I do have the experience of how Timwald and how Keys operate. And in having that experience, I would be able to hit the ground running. In fact, one of the things that will be in my manifesto, I'm doing an introductory letter, which will be out probably in the next few days and a manifesto later this month, is I'm referring to a private member's bill. And in that private member's bill, what I am proposing is that if an individual who is a, an MHK is in receipt of an Isle of Man government pension, then there should be a reduction applied to their salary equal to that amount. Now, I've already had a lot of criticism on social media. Well, that isn't going to happen because turkeys don't vote for Christmas and that other MHKs wouldn't support that. Now, I would hope MHKs would support that because we have a moral approach and that we've got people out there who are, need food banks, who are relying on support, who are waiting for cataract operations, hip replacements, etc. But if they don't support that, I've already made it very clear. I will donate that amount, the difference, to charity. And equally, I believe that MHKs should have a pay rise for the, uh, should not have a pay rise for the next five years. There should be a pay freeze. Now, if they don't support that, then that's fine by me, but I will donate the amount involved to local charities. But at the same time, it relies on the votes from MHKs, um, as, as any motion through Timwall does. Um, are you, are, do you not have any concerns that while this, this idea in particular might sound good to members of the public you know how how are you actually going to be able to drive this through to the most convincing point that you know you have the strongest chance to implement it because right right now um, as it stands yes yes it might sound it, it might sound good for people you know reading the likes of your manifesto and whatnot but there may be concerns that it doesn't go through. It might just look like a bit of an enticement rather than having any substance behind it. I'm not out, out there to put any enticements out there or any sound bites. I'm out there to say exactly what I'm prepared to do and would do. I would hope that if it did not get the support of Keys and did not get the support of Tim Wald, I would hope that there would be other members out there who would have the same moral conscience as me. I'm not trying to be some sort of do-gooder. I'm just turning around saying I could not personally accept that position if I was uh, in office because I think it's morally wrong to do so when we've got families and we've got businesses out there who are struggling to meet energy bills, to meet their food bills, and I think it's important that we put them first. What we have to remember with this, Rob, is that we are employed by the people. And that's what I'm saying, going back to your initial question about a reset in Manx politics. I think often it's very much forgotten that MHKs are actually employed by the people. It's the people out there who pay the salaries of MHKs and equally it's through their taxes that they pay that they're given to be guardians of the money to spend wisely on behalf of their constituents. And moving moving on slightly one of the things that you'd um that you'd mentioned is all around obviously you know uh, restructuring how the uh, the island budgets things going forward in your opinion with your background what's wrong with the manx financial system uh, I think the, well, the budget process itself, I know there's been lots of discussion as to whether we change the budget process. It's not so much changing the budget process, it's making sure that we are prioritising our funds properly. And by that, I think there are too many departments, I think there is far too much top-heavy management. We need to be both saving money and redeploying money to provide frontline services. You know, do we need as many many as eight government departments, for example, cabinet office just seems to continually grow and grow. We could look at something like a department of energies, utility and the environment. Think if you actually brought those those bodies together, the savings there could potentially be. What I'm not saying immediately is kick people out of posts. That would happen over time. But if you actually look at natural wastage across government, over a year, there's probably 5% 
uh, of people either retire or they resign. Even if we only saved 1% of that cost, because the government wage bill at the moment is over £400 million, even if we only saved 1% of that, that would be £4 million in the first year, £8 million in the second year. By the term of a whole administration, the administration from 2026 to 2031 could have £100 million more to play with. Yes, you could use that for some frontline services, but there's other big issues to have to deal with, like I said. Capital programmes for supporting housing, for climate change. We've got a climate change emergency. We saw with IPCC this week that they're turning around and saying it's code red to humanity. Now, the public out there may actually turn around and say, well, how does that affect us? We're only a small island. But we see it even in our own weather. We look, there's been flooding in Laxey. There's coastal erosion at Kurt Michael. Are we prepared to accept that going forward for our future generations? But you, you, you say it could be, but you know, obviously some departments you believe may be too big. But if you're just stretching that personnel over different areas, that's still the same amount of personnel. That's still going to cost certain no, amounts. No. And also actually setting up these departments could have costs in themselves. So could it not be more expensive? No, I wouldn't say. It's it's like the whole the whole issue over... If I may just go off at a slight tangent at the moment, it's the whole issue over online health, um, on-island health services. You know, do you pay more up front to get people uh, getting treated on the Isle of Man in order that uh, you're not paying for people going away? Is there a long-term saving? Yes, you may have, in some cases, bringing departments or bringing groups of people together a slight initial cost, but it's initial pain for long-term gain. And in terms of uh, just focusing on one side in particular here, another thing that you said you want to see um, more on-island health services, that's one thing that you do mention. But if you're talking about being more um, savvy with the island spending, could that not be seen as a little bit contradictory? It's, it's you know, obviously um, no one's, you know, questioning the, the idea of having more on-island um, health services. But if you're looking to be more savvy with the island's finances, you know, trying to bring in more health services, where, where is the calculation coming, I'm guessing, to, to make sure that that is cost effective? Well, first of all, I would say that I am going to actually be setting out costings in my manifesto around this. But if we just concentrate for a moment on the issue of on-island on health services... During the pandemic, we had cases, unfortunately, where people obviously weren't necessarily able to get away to get treatment. Um, it's important that we have as much treatment as we can on the Isle of Man. And I accept that there are an excellent set of health services in the North West that we will still have to remain reliant on. But when people are uh, ill... They want to be near their loved ones. They want to be near home, whether it's their grandparents, their parents, their partners, their children, their grandchildren. They want to be near them. And at the moment, we have the cost of them travelling away. We have the cost of expenditure of accommodation for them. If we have those services on an island, we are an island which is... In general, quite a wealthy and prosperous island. We need to be providing those services and first-class standards for the people that live here. But in, in, in terms, alongside that, you say obviously there, there, you know, there is the, the, the cost of travelling and accommodation and so forth. But if you're looking at bringing uh, more on-island health services, you could be having to consider the likes of um, new equipment, new departments, new personnel, salaries, for example. Um, is, is is that more expensive or less expensive than the travel costs at the moment? If we're talking purely in the sense of uh, the financial position, trying to be, as I say, a bit more savvy with the island's finances. Well, at the moment, I think certainly on the health side of things, we're probably using a lot of agencies. And if you look at the agency fees in last year's government accounts, they'd budgeted for 1.7 million and it was nigh on 10 million that we paid. We're paying agencies effectively so that they've got their cut, whereas if we're actually employing people here on the island we've got to make it it's an attractive place to bring them to to live and work and i think that is really really important that we do so uh, moving on just another thing that you've pointed out the um the housing crisis as you put it for young people um what are your main issues with the system and how do you plan on addressing that because it seems to be something that um is is still an ongoing matter without um, necessarily always a light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I think a lot of people have referred to affordable housing. Well, I'm not into sound bites. I'm going to actually set out in my manifesto a few ideas I think for taking this forward. 
Um, if we look at it, I know we've specifically referred to young people there, but I do think that whole issue is even wider because what we've got there are people who are wanting to downsize as well, how we actually deal with that. What we're doing at the moment, I think, is a, a, a lot of lower price properties aren't necessarily being bought locally. It's difficult for people to uh, afford those houses. We're not looking at off-island examples. If you look at Belfast City Council, they're currently building houses at £134,000 £134, they're selling them for. We need urban regeneration because if we have urban regeneration, that also has a knock-on effect with regard to a cleaner environment, people not travelling so much. It brings life into our towns such as Douglas. So I think there's a whole host of wider issues. But yes, it does affect young people, but it does affect a wider group of people, but just turning to young people for a moment, I often think they are the forgotten generation in by politicians and in elections. We've got to make sure that we have a good education system for them and we've got to support them with apprenticeships, internships and make sure that there's jobs here for them. Because if they don't stay here, if we lose... If we lose this younger generation from the island, it does have a severe knock-on effect on our economy. Just before we go further into that, just to come back to the um, the, the housing situation just for a moment. Obviously, there is the, the the issue that the likes of the construction industry are facing with uh, rising costs for supplies, for example, which have been caused by the pandemic. But another thing, the fact that the the island's average house price has, has, has kept going up. If you're you're talking about affordable housing and whatnot, the, the, the main issue there is not just about keeping people on, but driving that market price down how do you overcome such a, a, a big challenge like that because it doesn't just affect the housing that that comes in the future but the you know the homes that we already have here it would change you know that the the landscape of the market you know that's that's a huge challenge how I, would you how would you it's, it's a very that? good point that you raised there because the average house price on the island i think is three hundred thirteen thousand pounds compared to two hundred sixty seven thousand in england now what i would say with regard to that is we've really got to look at how we actually are allowing us to, are selling houses because if we just simply turn around and say oh we can sell these lower price houses off island and we can just let our market continue yes i believe in a free market i have no doubt that we've got to believe in a free market but we do have to tackle these issues we can't just sit around and say ah oh, everything can just continue like this forever and a day now there may be some real hard decisions that need to be taken over this we may have to look and turn around and say if people have got holiday homes here on the island well do we charge them some sort of levy we wouldn't couldn't charge them any additional tax because of the oecd play, uh, level playing field but we do have to really face up to these tough decisions we've got to have that debate out there but what i'm aiming to do is really get these ideas and issues on the table because i just do not feel as though they are even being discussed and we've also got to get input from our young people one of my other ideas is that we have focus groups in certain parts of the community what i would look to set up even in the douglas south constituency is to have a focus group where we're getting young people say even even under voting age from say 14 to 25 to get their views going forward as well and finally, we are going to have to uh, wrap this up. We've got about a minute and a half or so here. But if you if, if you could just sum up very quickly, I guess, obviously, you know, D Douglas South, there are other candidates out there. How, how are you going to stand out from those that are already running, do you believe? Um, well, I believe that I am a forward-thinking, progressive politician. I'm setting out some uh, real policies, really detailed policies out there. I am easily approachable, whether it's constituents or not, but I believe I'm the right person to be a good, hard-working and genuine local and national politician. And I can assure the people of South Douglas and the rest of the island that I would work so hard and with such energy and enthusiasm for them. And just one th final thing to add on top of that, just going uh, briefly back just for a moment on the fact, that obviously, um, being someone who's um, worked worked within the Treasury has um, obviously uh, you know a, a, a large amount of experience in that field. How do you upgrade that to a to a national level to to an MHK position? 
There is I've, there are so many more topics I, to consider. I, I I've worked with various administrations. Uh, I've worked with various politicians, and I believe that I'm in a very good place to actually bring that experience. And with the rest of the house, from people from all sectors of life, from all various businesses, small businesses that need support, etc., all those people, I believe we could work collaboratively together and use that entire skill set for the benefit of the island. Obviously, not not just on the national basis, but the, obviously the local front in Douglas South itself. And you know, yeah. how do you, how do you translate that? Well, I, I I will be making sure I would be making sure that I have many political surgeries. I would hold public meetings, and I will be out and about. I would not be an MHK who appears once every five years. I wouldn't have this groundhog approach of just appearing when I need a vote. I will be out there. I will be active, and I would be working with the community in Douglas South.